Good news, folks. I've only got 18% battery, so we'll see how long it lasts. <laughs> Uh, it could be, it could be, yeah, so, you know, how short can it be? Okay, we'll see how long the battery. So you can pray either way. You can pray the battery depletes quickly, or, or yeah, so we'll see who's the best prayer warrior. Okay, in the group. All right, but, <clears throat> no. I think everything's good with the pastor. They're in Richmond, Virginia, or that area. Uh, out east with his son and uh, their family and the pastor there so you can be praying for them all right we're going to talk tonight about church administration and authority you know say oh boy this sounds good and boring you know but i believe that if we don't understand the principle of how god empowers the church and where he places his authority and how he gives it, this is what's happened. And it's like in human government when no one is in, you know, when nobody knows who's in charge, we're in trouble. And the problem in the church is, is God didn't leave the church empty-handed and without authority and without a structure. He would never do that. I mean, you know, it's kind of like when no one is in charge, you're in trouble. And, uh, and that was happening in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. God in, in his governmental structure, I, now this is a carbon. I never heard anyone else teach this, but I believe God's form of government is always the same. Whether it be the home, whether it be the church, or whether it be human government. Let me start with human government, with government. What is the best form, what is God, let me say it this way, what is God's form of human government? Benevolent, benevolent Part, a benevolent autocracy, I prefer to call it, a benevolent autocracy, and which we would call what? Monarchy. A monarchy. A monarchy, why? Because what position will Jesus take when he rules and reigns? He will be the king of kings and lord of lords, right? And whenever he established a government in Israel, what did he establish? He established Saul as king. Okay, that's the form of government that God established. But he intended the, the monarch to be a benevolent monarch, not a dictatorial monarch. That's why I prefer a benevolent autocracy rather than a benevolent dictatorship, okay? It's, it's one who is kind, yet he has ultimate authority over the group. In the home, what is God's form of leadership? And a husband. Husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. In fact, he, he gives us that picture. And I've already given you the lead for the next one, okay? But the home, the man is the head of the home. Now, he's not to rule it as a dictator or as or lord it over God's heritage. He's not to be kind. He's supposed to be, how does Christ love the church? He gave himself for it. Husband, love your wives and give yourself for them. You know, the issue is not to... I'm the head of this house. I always say, if you have to tell them you're the head of the home, you're not. <laughs> if you have to tell them you are, you're not leading. You're not leading. Because good authority leads without demanding it. It leads by example. And it leads, and it's the one the people want to follow because they know they care. They knows, knows there's a passion and a caring about it. So we see that. Then when it comes to the church, and this is where the whole structure, and the interesting thing is God created nations. He didn't create one world government. One day there will be one, but it'll be under him. He didn't create, um, everybody isn't in one family. He created lots of families, and he created the man as being the head of 
all those individual families. And he didn't create denominations or a Catholic or global church. He created local churches. Why? Because one day he will be the head of it. But the picture is here. He knew, hey, the danger is, is you let man become the head of a global government, he will be, there is no such thing as a benevolent guy over the world government. <laughs> it will not be benevolent. And there won't be, a, there isn't a benevolent father over all the families of the earth. There isn't also a benevolent head over all the churches. So he created local churches. He created single local churches. And I believe that the local church is a picture of all those. In God's government, God keeps things simple. He doesn't change his mind. So, well, I think this is good over here, but this is probably good over here. I think it's all the same. Why? It does make it complex then, does it? So let's go take a look at the authority of the church. Okay, first of all, leadership in the church is a servant leadership. He said, he that, we be great, he that would be great among you must first be his servant. The job of leadership is to serve. It's not to lord and dictate and demand. So when we talk about leadership and ruling and everything in this, what it is is it gives a focal point of leadership. And that's what is key. But the role of leadership in the Bible. Let's go, to, let's go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Now he's going to be talking to the apostles sometimes and to then like Timothy and he'll be talking to some of the young pastors in, in the ministry here. We're going to see different things. But go to Acts 20 and verse 28 because we see that um, there is a job and what is that job of that pastor and uh, of that shepherd? Okay, that's, we're going to look at the terminologies as well as we go on here. Uh, verse uh, 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which um, the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. The word overseers there is? It's the word bishop. What's the other word that we get there? There's another word that uh, we use. No, that's elder. It's uh, epis episcopos. It's the it's the Hebrew word, or the Greek word episkopos, where we get episcopalian, because that's a bishopric form of church government, where there is an. But the word just means overseer, one who oversees things. He says, "Whom the Lord hath made you, the one who oversees, or a bishopric, or the overseers." Okay, to Feed the church of God, which um, he hath purchased with his own blood. So he's instructing them to feed the flock. So the job of the overseer is to feed them spiritual food. Give them that. His job isn't to them to feed him. You know, uh, you know, you're supposed to feed the flock, not the flock feed you. Okay, so pastors need to get that one right. Uh, uh, feed spiritual food. Yeah, the spiritual food. Okay, spiritual food here. Okay, go to Second Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. We're going to see this again. It, always remember, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. And he gives very two very clear passages on this whole responsibility of the overseer, of the bishop, of the this episcopos, this, this one. Amen. First Peter chapter five, first Peter chapter five and verse two. So there it says, feed the flock of God. You think he's trying to get a point across to us? <laughs> okay, sounds like the other verse. In fact, I double took when I was reading, I had put him in there when I was reviewing tonight before I started. Uh, I was reading, I said, oh, did I put mess the verse in twice? Cause it, you know, it's like almost like the one before, which is among you. Taking the oversight, there's that same word, episkopos, that oversight, overseer, um, thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So he gives not only what you're to do, but the heart matter. Because that leadership, and this is one thing. Uh, 
I hope Pastor stays with us a long time, but he's already indicated that in the next few years he's going to try to be backing down, and we understand that. Uh, we want to help him last as long as he can. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think maturity and everything is so important, and we're going to talk about a little bit about that. But not for constraint, not because he has to. See, if you do it because you have to, you don't do it right. You know, it's kind of like raising children. Someone said, you know, uh, you know, I, people say, you know, it's, there's a law that says you have to feed your children. You can't starve your child. Would you agree with me? That, that would be child abuse, right? But you know what? The law never caused me to feed my child. I never fed my kids because I had to. <laughs> you know, and a pastor ought not to feed the flock of God and minister and care for them because he has to. He, has to, he should do it because not by constraint, because somebody made him do it. He needs to be doing because he wants to. And he needs not do it for money, for filthy lucre, but he needs to do it because it's a passion of his heart. And whenever God takes that passion of heart, and it, sometimes God will remove that passion. I've got a very good friend, probably the, one of the best mission preachers I ever heard is Brother Joe West. And he pastored Town East Baptist Church. His name was Joe West, but he pastored Town East Baptist Church in san antonio texas for 32 years and he said one day god just took it off his heart his son pastors it now and he went out preaching for missions and everything but you know god took that off so he needed to get out of there why because he would have done it by constraint even though it wouldn't have been a mean constraint he would have been in being obedient he didn't do it because it was a heart thing so and what are you supposed to do there let's go to second timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 going to tell us what he should do when he is feeding the flock of God. He's going to tell us exactly what, how he ought to do that. If we ever have to get another pastor, these are the things that we have to look for. We have to look for why, does the, why, why is this man interested in pastoring our church? Uh, you know, and there's, Doctrine is going to be important, but this, I believe, is more important. Now, not to neglect doctrine. I mean, obviously, if he has a wrong doctrine, it's one thing. But if there's a, a fine line of something, this or this, you know, you think, well, you know, hey, we all have different opinions. There isn't one of us that agree on everything here. And there's going to be a variety. But what's more important is his heart attitude towards the ministry and towards the heart of God, okay? He said, preach the word. Okay, so again, feeding the flock of God. Be instant in season and out of season. Uh, well, he just had a bad day. Uh, no. Needs to be ready, always. So he's going to reprove. Uh, preacher's got to be willing to reprove the flock. He needs to be able to rebuke. What's the difference between the reprove and rebuke? They're very similar. They are similar. Anybody give us an idea? Well, oh, rebuke means he gets cranky. <laughs> and reprove is a bit different. Uh, I always look at Right. And a reprove is you could be doing this better. Just that slight difference in the correction. Yeah. That's how I like to look at it. Is that what son <laughs> <laughs> So uh, reprove is like improve. That's kind of the way yeah, I've yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's one way to look at it. Reprove is improve. Rebuke is jerking the chain. <laughs> jerk the chain. And you know, there's guys who can't jerk the chain. And eventually what happens is they don't deal with problems in the flock. And when they don't deal with the problems in the flock, eventually it infects the flock. And, and, and friends, one thing we always have to be willing to do is sometimes our pastor will be in a position where he has to rebuke somebody. And you know what? He may rebuke him, and you may not see it quite the way he does, but you need to support him. Just like a husband and wife. Paul and I agreed 99% of the time on how to deal with our kids. But when we didn't, and if one of us took action to discipline our children, they never knew that we didn't agree. 
because if the disagreement, the disagreement wasn't with that, the disagreement, it was supporting authority. It's like a teacher at school. Unless they are totally out of line. In fact, I had one time, I went to a teacher at school and I said, I supported what you did with my child today, but don't you ever do that again. <laughs> I said, that was uncalled for and I went, and went down the line. I said, I will not support you next time, but I will support you this time. I made it very clear. My kids didn't know that I did that, but why? Supporting authority. Why? First of all, none of us have all the answers. The principle is to support the authority. Unless they're doing something that is sinful or unbiblic, totally unbiblical, the support needs to be there. Because they're having to call it and make the tough decisions. I've, I've been in that position. I've, I've done church discipline on people. <laughs> and uh, that's a hard one. And I, I did it in, in a very difficult situation. Those decisions aren't easy to make. But you ought to be the one that, yes, I support you. Why? Because it's just like supporting in a marriage. It's supporting in any of these places. We decided that you're the one to lead, and someone has to make those decisions. And if every time they make a decision, they're challenged by you or by the people of the church, you know what eventually they won't do? Is they won't rebuke. And then you're gonna pay the price because sin won't be dealt with, and it'll come back. It's like a shepherd who doesn't take and get the diseased sheep out of the flock. Now you may think it's no big deal, you know what? He may have some insight you don't have. <laughs> and he may know some things you don't know. So always support him. You know, reprove, rebuke, exhort, um, exhort teaching and with all long-suffering and doctrine. And I like it. With all long-suffering. You know, pastors have to be long-suffering, and usually they are. And it, remember, too, don't say, how come he's not dealing with that? It says long-suffering. <laughs> and that means you suffer long. That's what it means. You, know, it's, uh, I, you have to get in the Greek to get that. But so what's the exhort part mean? Does that mean Exor help? And exhortation is what I'm doing right now. I'm telling you what the word, expounding the word of God, exhorting and, and encouraging, you, telling you do this and do that, helping you. That's what that's what I'm really basically doing right now. Okay, so I'm exhorting. Telling. Yeah, telling you. Here's how you can do it. Here's the best way to do it. Here's what the Bible says, okay? And then doctrine is the teachings of the Bible put into practice. I always call it doctrine is the do of the Bible. It's what you do. Yep. So, okay. Like, okay, get baptized. That's something you do. Okay, take Lord's Supper. That's something you do. Read your Bible. That's something you do, you know? Those are all do's, okay? Uh, the rules of leaders, okay? Uh, so... We need to make sure that we support them, and that's the leadership of the church. Um, okay, I'll, I do not believe in what's called elder rule, and that is a group of people. Um, you know what they say, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. You know, um, <laughs> I know there's a lot of teaching of elder rule. There's a group, guy in America that was popularized it. And interestingly enough, I knew a guy that used to be one of his elders in that church. And we asked him, because he was no longer in the church, we asked him, they said, when John sat down, that was his name, uh, many of you know who I'm talking about, uh, sat down at the board table with the other elders, and John said something, what did you do? We did what he said. <laughs> Uh, so some elders were more elder than others. Let's put it this way, you know. Some were more equal. They were supposed to be equal, but some were more equal than others. And uh, usually that's the way it is. And unfortunately, he, he's taught that. And many guys went back to their churches and said, okay, we're going to have elder rule. I'm going to appoint you and you. And you. you know, we're going to have this group of men that we're going to lead this church. The next thing they knew, they weren't pastor of the church anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, it it falls apart because... Whenever there is response authority, there has to be responsibility. And a lot of people want authority without responsibility. Uh, yes, can you have multiple pastors? Yes, but I think ultimately there always has to be a, for lack of a better term, a senior pastor. The buck has to stop someplace. 
And it's just like in the home. Do I take counsel of my wife? Yeah, he who doesn't take counsel of his wife is an idiot. Okay? But if there's a decision, that final decision has to be made, somebody has to make it. We can't sit there and look at each other and say, what do you do? Well, whatever you think. Well, whatever you think. Whatever you think. Make a decision, you know? It, uh, somebody has to make that final decision and uh, you know take counsel take counsel that you're foolish if you don't but at the end of the line somebody has to make the decision and uh, that's got to be made by a pastor I believe so okay a picture for the pastor is always uh, the old what would Jesus do how would he lead because remember what we're doing is we're picturing Jesus Christ as a pastor, he's picturing the Lord being the head of the flock because one day he will be of the whole flock. And my job when I was pastoring was to show forth Christ. How would Christ lead the flock of God? Now, folks, pastors don't always get it right, but I hope you give them a lot of grace. I hope you give them a lot of grace. It is not an easy job. And if anybody wants I to, old time, but I said, anybody want to be pastor? Nobody ever raised their hand. Now, they want to tell you what to do, but they don't want to raise their hand, you know, and do that and everything. So we are to show what it will be like one day as a pastor, okay? Then a prepara uh, the preparation. How will Jesus rule during that time? Well, he's going to rule over all. He's going to oversee us. He's going to do those things. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because what we have to realize is whether you're the pastor or whether you're uh, a member of the flock, one day you say, well, I wish I was pastor. You're going to get your chance. Did you realize that? If you're obedient, look at 2 Timothy 2.12. It says, if we suffer, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, if you suffer, okay, we shall also reign with him. If we uh, deny him, um, he also will deny us. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Right, it's almost the back. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Such, and such the second death hath no uh, power, but they shall be uh, priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Do you realize that uh, obedient saints are going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium? So you're going to be in charge. So remember, you reap what you sow. <laughs> be a good follower because one day you may have God says well you're going to rule and reign with me but boy you were a mess down there okay now uh, ruling and reigning with me okay you, you get to go lead these guys <laughs> these are the ones you get to rule and reign and he'll give you a bunch of people just like you were so my advice is do a good job of following because one day you're going to be leading and you may get a bunch of followers like that, okay? But what do we have? Uh, we have a clear purpose for what we do. Okay, we've got some words that are used in the Bible and these are probably where a lot of the problem comes from is because people, I believe, misuse the words. There's three words, elder, bishop, and pastor. And people say, well, who are those people? Some churches have bishops. They got the funny hats on top of their head and different things like that. And then um, some have elders. They knock on your door. It says Elder Smith. And he's 22 years old. <laughs> or 19. Elder. Okay. You think that word has a little bit of meaning to it? Okay. And then you have pastor. All that lowly pastor, which is frankly the term I prefer. They're all the same person. Yeah, pastor, bishop, elder. Okay, what, what does it mean? Well, 
what do you think elder means? It has the context of mature. Mature. Now, you could be mature. You notice Jesus didn't start the ministry until he was 30 years old. And John the Baptist probably was almost that age. We don't know how long. Somebody said the other day, I think one of the preachers said, you know, we don't really know how long his ministry was, but it was probably anywhere from six months to two years. And remember, he was only six months older than Jesus. So he was probably in his late 20s. And you couldn't be operate in the priesthood in the Jewish economy until you were 30 either. So all those things tend to say, if you say, well, what, how old do you need to be to be an elder? I think 30 is a good number. I think it, you know, it's, it's at that point. But it means mature and uh, re a requirement of experience. And um, when it talks about the appointment of elders or the bishops in, in the passages in Timothy and in Titus, it talks about, you know, not a novice. That's, that's part of the requirement. So it's an indication of his spiritual state. The second thing you find is um, a bishop. That's his job. That's a job description. An accountant, a contractor, a carpenter, a plumber. That's the description of the job. A bishop is an overseer. That's the description of the job. A pastor comes from the word pastoral, pasture. It's a shepherd. It's what he does. You know, he's a bean counter. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> what, what does he do? You know, it's what he does. He pounds nails. He, you know, he uh, d does something else. Okay. It's a description. So pastoring is shepherding the flock feeding the flock of God. That's pasturing, okay? Overseeing is the responsibility or the job description. And then there. So I, they're all three, in my opinion, the same. And the same requirements or very similar requirements are given in the different passages for them. Uh, what does the shepherd do with the flock? He takes care of them. And, and I think those are pretty simple. But they're the authority and they're the positions. Now, what do you do with those? Now, you have another position in the church, and the other position is a deacon. Appointed in the book of Acts, deacons are put in a church when the church grows to such a point that the pastor or the shepherd cannot handle all the things and the needs of the flock. And when it was getting too much where he couldn't, minister the word and feed the flock of God because he was waiting on tables and helping the sick and the poor and doing all those things, they appointed deacons to take up that role. Now, my opinion is that, well, a church our size, I never had deacons at Sunshine, and I, I'm not sure where you need deacons. I think the best job is, is good men in the church start deaking, and then one day you call them a deacon. I don't think you ought to make deacons out of people. I think deacons ought to make deacons out of themselves. They are already doing the job and you just acknowledge it. You know, people, people want titles today. You know, people, everybody wants a name. You know, they want a title and everything. I think, just do the job. Do the ministry. That's the work of the ministry. Every one of us ought to be helping people. Everybody ought to be doing what those deacons were doing. The problem is a bunch of people were sitting back, letting the bishop, the pastor, do all the work, the apostles do all the work, and not ministering. Do the job. Maybe we'll give you a title one day. But if you're doing it for the title, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You ought to do it because you care about people and because you love people. So that's, that's my two cents worth on deacons. We don't have any deacons at this church, by the way, if you wondered. Why? We're not big enough. One day, hey, hey, praise the Lord. I'll be glad the day that we need deacons. But until then, just everybody do a little deaking and we'll take care of it, okay? We just, we just take care of it by doing it. And one day if we need a title, you know, you know what I think? When you get to the point where you need them and you're going to appoint them, the people who are really doing the deaking don't want the title. 
interesting thing. The people who want the title are the ones who are, probably weren't doing it in the first place. Kind of an interesting thought, but okay, I'll, just, I'll let you chew on that one a little bit. Okay. And then Hebrews chapter 13, and we'll close with these, but here are some verses that every Christian ought to memorize. And uh, when you're struggling with things, here's the command of God. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. You're to bring in remembrance and pray for your pastor. Because he has the rule. He's been given that responsibility. He's been given that authority to rule over you. If you're a member of this church. He is your pastor and you're to remember him. You're to acknowledge him. You're to meet his needs. You're to be a good minister of your pastor. I'm not here to tell you, and this is one of those passages that's impossible for a pastor to preach, but I can tell you, because I've been on the other side and I know what it's like, and I know what we ought to do. And lifting up your pastor, that's why you notice I slip once in a while when I'm talking to him personally, but most I always call him pastor. I don't call him Bill. I call him pastor. Why? Uh, if I met the prime minister, I wouldn't call him by his first name. If I met the president of the United States, I wouldn't call him by his first name. If I met the queen of England, I'd even address her even though I don't respect her don't as your majesty. Why? Because of the position they hold. And I would show respect. And it's a respect for the office. And I think, I remember I used to have a guy that, uh, well, there, there used to be a man in this church who always called Pastor Bill. <laughs> it bothered me to no end. It's saying, when I call you by your first name, I, to me it says we're at equal level. If a man has a rule over me, that means there's a respect that is, is deserved because of the position. You meet a police officer, you don't look at his name tag and say, oh, hey, Joe, do you? You say, yes, sir, <laughs> is what you say. You, you respect him. And I think, to me, remember them that have the rule over you. Why? Who have sp spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Man, don't you want somebody that you can follow and learn to grow in the Lord? Considering the end of their conversation. You realize what the end of pastor's conversation is? He's going to have to give an account to God for every one of you and me. They're going to say, why did Neville, how come you let Neville do this? And everything that every, and Alice, and go right down the line, and Paul, right down the line, he's going to look at everyone, and, and Ash, you let Ash. Boy, you realize the pastor's going to have to answer for every one of you? How many want that role? Okay. Hey, if somebody's going to have to give an account for me, I think I owe a little bit to them. I think I do. And then verse 17 of the same chapter, Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. The reason you obey and listen to the pastor and seek his counsel is because that guy is the guy that's going to have to give an account for you. You know, somebody says, oh, I wish I was the pastor. Oh, you want to give account for everybody and all these people. You want to respond to God. You want to stand there. You think twice before you that. 
I've got a few years of people I have to answer for one day. Um, and then he said, salute them that have the rule over you and all the saints. He said, salute them, you know, you know, show respect towards them, honor them. Folks, we have a responsibility to have a respect for the authority and the responsibility of our pastor. And frankly, I was glad I was able to talk about this when he wasn't here. Because it's an impossible one for a pastor to preach to his own people. And it's hard for even another person to do it when the pastor's sitting in the room. But that's why we honor the pastor. That's why we respect him. He's got to give a kind, he's going to have to answer for every one of us. And I don't think you want to do that. So give him his just deserves. And you know what? I believe when you do that, God will bless you. God will honor you. I mean, he'll, he'll overlook a lot of things that cover a multitude of sins, as the Bible talks in another place. If you'll respect and honor authority. When you undermine authority and you hurt authority, you're only hurting yourself. You're only hurting yourself. Let's, let's as a church and as a group of people, the group of people here, really take that to heart and really realize that we have a good pastor. We have a man that has a great heart and a tender heart. I mean, and there isn't a guy, you know, you can't ever say that pastor, pastor lords it over God's heritage. He certainly does not have that spirit. So he's, he's a good man. And so let's encourage him and support him. He has a big job. He has a big job.